the first time I suspected that Jacob might be deaf was when I went to the beach. He was eight months old at the time. He was playing in the sand, and this huge black dog was running back and forth, barking, barking, and Jacob didn't turn around or respond. And until then, it hadn't occurred to me that he might not be hearing anything. And so I called my doctor, and I took him in, and the pediatrician said, oh, don't worry, he seems to have a little congestion. Children sometimes lose hearing temporarily. It, it often comes back. Jake, please, try. No. You don't like them? I want you to put them on, and then we'll go for a walk. We'll go for a walk in the rain. We did a lot of home testing, you know, clapping our hands, banging doors, looking for reaction, and saw none. Will you play? Will you play? I insisted that the kid be tested. If Jacob was having a hearing problem, early intervention would be the best thing for him. Really? Well, I don't know what you're feeling. How about lions? How about lions? Lions. And monsters? Yeah. And cheese? <laughs> oh, and alligators? And he wants to go to the zoo, uh, I guess. And I took Jake in, and he was tested. They did a brain stem. Uh, they did some audiometric tests. That's cool. Where Jake was supposed to look at a barking dog, or a light would blink if he responded to a sound. Do you think? Maybe we'll see a rainbow? A rainbow? It didn't look good, but I didn't know what was going on. The one thing the audiologist made clear was that we needed to aid Jake immediately. And so we started the process of selecting hearing aids for Jacob, which is sort of a random process because they aren't really sure whether the child is reacting to sound at all. And of course, not having sound, the kid may not be tuned into the sound yet either. He was eight months old at the time. I would say within five months, Jacob was aided with the body aids, which I guess turned out to be the appropriate aids for him. I have many parents who come into the office every single day who ask me, are you sure my child can hear? Virtually every child will respond to a loud hand clap. Deaf children will respond to that hand clap too. The response is variable enough though so that even if you don't get a response, you don't necessarily have to, you don't, the child is not necessarily deaf. And Peden's audiometry can be used at virtually any age, but all that does is measure eardrum vibration. That still doesn't tell you whether or not a child can hear. My initial referrals are usually to a speech and hearing clinic at a Children's Hospital or to a private speech and hearing uh, specialist. We like to see children who've already had um, at least tympanometry done in the pediatric office because then at least we know whether or not the middle ear system is functioning normally. That's a nice thing to know, because then when you're testing hearing, you can know how much of it might be tainted by some system problem in the middle ear. The other thing is, however, that if only tympanometry is done, it's possible to miss a serious hearing loss, because tympanometry does not tell you the state of hearing, only the function of the ear. The more sophisticated equipment for measuring hearing involves electroencephalographic EEG type equipment, measuring the response from the brain to noise. An average child should not be screened that way. People expect an electrode to be something that pierces your skin or something. It's just a surface electrode. 
Want to do one for Mommy? I think he's going to feel better if he can see you do Brain stem it. testing okay. is an objective measure of neural firing from the ear to the brain. It does not measure hearing. I don't feel anything. Nothing. See, it's so great that you can communicate with him because you can tell him there's nothing to it. The average mother can only hope he understands there's nothing to it. Uh -huh. If there is no evidence of a waveform from the brainstem testing, then you may hypothesize that there is also no usable hearing in that ear. You need behavioral testing in conjunction with the brainstem findings so you can make an actual statement about whether or not you're looking at hearing or some other factor that is going on between the ear and the brain. Okay. Now you have to go to ski. Okay. One of the difficulties in doing brainstem on young children is that frequently they need to be heavily sedated in order to do the brainstem testing. Well, if you heavily sedate a child, it is not proper to do it unless you have a physician on staff. Brainstem testing is also expensive. The equipment is extremely expensive. It's a lengthy test, and the write-up is lengthy. However, sometimes it's the only thing that makes clear what the behavioral testing really means. See if you can hear, put it in. Jacob, put it in. Jacob. Jacob, put it in. Put it in, Jacob. Now he's just been waiting. Just waiting away. Play audiometry is a Jacob, relatively simple conditioning technique without telling a child what you want him to do. You hold his hand, you hold a toy in his hand, and you help him to complete the toy in some manner whenever a sound is presented. Eventually, he makes that connection and does the toy all by himself because he now knows that when he hears, he has to put something in or he has to stack something. Good work. Great. Play audiometry is performed on a child usually between 36 months and 48 months. Some five- and six-year-olds still need it because they're just not mature enough to do anything else, and they shouldn't be expected to. The most important thing you want is a hearing test, not a test of the child's behavior. Good work. That's right. Generally, an audiogram has two sets of numbers. The numbers that go across the horizontal line talk about frequency or pitch. Hertz is a, is a unit of frequency, and it involves the number of cycles per second that a tone is being presented. So if something is moving with fewer cycles per second, it becomes a lower pitch tone. If there are a greater number of cycles per second, it becomes a higher pitch tone. The first number is middle C. The numbers that go down the vertical axis of the audiogram are volume, and they range from 0 to 110 decibels, which is loudness, 0 being the very softest and 110 being the loudest that we can measure. Primarily for listening to speech and interpreting speech, we use from about 500 to 3,000 hertz. If you have hearing at all of those frequencies, you have a greater chance of having better speech understanding. Put it in. On Jacob's audiogram, he has hearing only in the low um, frequency range. Do something with the Jacob's right ear only has hearing at 250, 500, and 750 hertz. So he's missing that high frequency range. And the high frequency range is the most important range for understanding consonants of speech. Take it off. <laughs> In his left ear, he has hearing throughout the frequency range, but only at maximum limits of the audiometer. The only thing he would really hear without a hearing aid would be oh, banging of a drum, something that would almost have to be vibratory for him to hear it. This is an example of what Jacob might hear without his hearing aid. Okay, could we hook up his hearing aid? What number does he usually wear the mask? As long as he can without that. That feedback? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I tested them. Okay, great. All right, now let's listen. Wait for Pat. Okay, we'll do it together. This is an example of what Jacob might hear with his hearing aid.
Jacob responded to voice in the sound field at 35 decibels. If you want to be a purist, 35 decibels means that he has a mild hearing loss. But of course, it is foolish to assume that Jacob has a mild hearing loss now that he has a hearing aid. He does not have a mild hearing loss. He is able to respond to voice that is produced in a mild manner. There is no way he's going to comprehend conversation that's delivered in a mild manner. He needs a lot more sound than that. He needs lip reading. He needs a lot more clues than that. Every day before Jake wears his hearing aids to school, it's a good idea for you to listen to his hearing aids to make sure they're in good working order. Uh, the battery is the first thing you should check. Now, generally, it's best to check your battery at night before he goes to bed, because after a hearing aid's been used all day long, that it'll be at its lowest voltage at night, whereas if it has a chance to rest overnight by being taken out of the hearing aid, in the morning it may show good and yet die very quickly afterwards. So the battery I would check at night. In terms of listening to the rest of it, you should get yourself a little stethoscope device like this. And since this is a body aid, you hook the receiver, you take the ear mold off the receiver, this parts the receiver, and it hooks into the stethoscope and then you gradually increase the volume on the hearing aid. Not too loud, because you'll hurt your ears, since you don't have a hearing loss. And you listen to see, first of all, if there's any distortion, if there's any static as you roll up the volume. And if the sound appears to get gradually louder, rather, instead of being soft, 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 suddenly loud, you don't want that. You want it to be gradually increasing in volume and having a nice quality of sound as you raise it up. Now, I can't turn this all the way up because it gets too loud for me. And you continue to listen to it. Now, this A doesn't sound like it has as much power as it should for him. So we'll have to test it on the test box. It sounds reduced in power from what he has been using in the past. One of the things we need to do, especially with children's hearing aids, is we absolutely need to be sure they're functioning in a consistent manner at all times. One of the things you see when you go out into the public schools is you see children walking around with hearing aids that work about 50% of the time. And there's been heavy documentation of that. So when a child and his parents make the effort to get to the audiologist, the audiologist must examine the hearing aid to see how it's functioning, to be sure that it's within specifications and that it's functioning the way it did when it gave the best results for the youngster. I was wondering if maybe we should switch Jake over to earlobe blades. It'd probably be easier for him if he had them instead of something on his head. Mm -hmm. Our concerns in the past with Jacob were not really a power consideration because you get fairly equal power out of a body aid as well as you can out of an ear level aid. So power is not really the concern for Jacob. The reason we went to the body aid is because the cartilage on his top of his ear is very soft. And if you put on a heavier instrument, a heavier hearing aid, which generally the higher powered over the ear aids tend to be heavier, um, it can change the shape of his ear as well as weighting it down too much for him. So our concern was that it would change the shape of the cartilage on his ear. As his cartilage becomes more, becomes more firm, then we can put an ear level aid on and it will stay on his ear without having to be taped down. The other problem that we have with ear level aids is in terms of the fit, the tightness of the ear mold. Uh, it is a little more difficult to get a tight fitted ear mold on a what we call postericular behind the ear aid than it is on a body aid because the receiver and the microphone are separated by a great distance on a body aid. On an ear level aid, the receiver and the microphone are right next to each other. Um, the variables that tend to affect the fit of the mold would be either the impression that's taken, what happens to it en route to the ear mold lab, shrinkage of the fabric itself, and what happens in the ear mold lab as they make it up. But for the most part, we can get nice tight-fitting ear molds and good power out of an ear level aid. So as soon as his, the shape of his ear is firm enough or solid enough for us to do it comfortably, we will switch him over to the ear level aids. We had a mother come in a few months ago and asked us if we could make ear molds. And I said, oh, certainly nothing to it. We'll be happy to do it. She asked us how much they would be, and I told her. And she said, because I've already spent $225 on ear molds in the past few months, and so I'm not eager to spend a lot more. 
Well, after I picked myself up off the floor, I said, could you explain to me why you spent so much? And she said, um, well, she said, first of all, the first pair were hard and hurt her ears. And by the way, we always make soft ear molds for all children because they're more comfortable in the ear and they fill the ear better. They tend to control the sound better than the hard ear molds. And kids are constantly falling down or getting hit in the head. A hard ear mold leads to a very bad bruise. All in all, I think they had five or six sets of ear molds within the past several months, and they were made to buy each one. And of course, any ear mold lab gives a guarantee to the dispenser that for at least 60 days, the ear molds will be replaced if it is due to um, leakage, poor fit, etc. You need to remember that federal and state laws require that a 30-day trial be offered before purchase of a hearing aid. And this is true whether they're children or adults. As one of the assumptions is that if you take the hearing aid home, you may find that it does not function in your daily life. The classroom instructor, the speech pathologist working with them, the parents, and so on, will notice that the hearing aid does not provide them with um, the kind of fineness of response that they would like. And a, a different hearing aid under trial may show to be the one that really does that for them. Um, what's the lifespan of an aid like this? Generally, the lifespan of a hearing aid that's worn full-time, as Jake's is, and a child goes from three to five years. Five years is probably the very maximum we would expect on an aid worn by a child full-time. Should he take it off when he plays in the sand at school? or? Yeah. If he's playing in the sand, it's probably a good idea either to get a cover for the microphone so that the sand doesn't get in, or if you think he's going to be really active and turning around and there's a chance it will fall into the sand, yes, I would take it out because sand is deadly to a microphone of a hearing aid. Uh, if he does gymnastic kind of activities where he's flipping over, then I would take, it out, take them out. Other than that, he can pretty much wear his hearing aids, you know, doing baseball or, you know, basketball or things like that, little sports activities that he would do. And of course, you can't get them wet. He can't swim with them. <laughs> but there are several different kinds of hearing aids that can be used. We saw the body aid on Jacob, which fits right here on the body, usually in a little canvas pocket with a cord. The um, most commonly worn hearing aid today is the behind-the-ear hearing aid, which fits directly behind the ear with an ear mold attached that goes into the ear. And those hearing aids are being used on almost every variety of hearing loss now, all the way up in, to and including the severe to profound hearing loss. The hearing aids which are diminishing in their use and in their popularity are the eyeglass hearing aids. And the reason is because uh, there's so much more is being done with other kinds of hearing aids. And also, most people don't want their eyes and their ears attached. They don't want their hearing and their vision put together. They want it separate. What everybody is... Um, using in large numbers these days is called the in-the-ear hearing aid and it's the whole hearing aid in one piece. Battery right there, the volume control wheel right there, the microphone is a tiny opening up there. The limitation on this is that it cannot go on anybody who has a severe or profound hearing loss because you would have constant feedback. The other hearing aid which is um, slowly but definitely gaining in acceptance is the canal aid. This is the canal aid, just one little piece. That's the whole hearing aid. Battery case is up here. You have a volume wheel right here. You can imagine, of course, that the major thing wrong with this is that it really can't be used on anybody with a severe hearing loss because there's no way you could effectively completely seal off a whole ear canal to make it function well enough. laryngologist will do further evaluations and whose job is to have the definitive discussion with you about deafness, what can be done, what can't be done. Oh yeah. Good, put it in the box. I was sick when I was pregnant, but I knew that there was something wrong with the baby. Oh, yeah. And I was just to say, please, if there's anything wrong with the baby, let her only be deaf. Hop, hop, hop. The dog went hump, hump, hump. When we take a look at the ear, what we can see is only up to the eardrum. Mm -hmm. So we see the outer ear, the ear canal, and the eardrum itself. The ear is divided into three parts, the outer, middle, and inner ear. The sound waves are collected by the outer ear, 
vibrations are transferred across the eardrum through the three bones of hearing to the inner ear. Tally's problem is in her inner ear. When the cause of the hearing loss is in the outer or middle ear, medicine and or surgery can frequently restore normal hearing. When the cause of the loss is in the inner ear, medicine and or surgery cannot restore normal hearing at this time. Patients with inner ear losses can receive benefit from hearing aids. Tally has a severe to profound sensorineural hearing loss in both ears. This is an example of what Tally might hear without her hearing aids. Tally will require powerful posterior aids. The exact type and settings will be determined by the hearing aid evaluation performed by the audiologist. This is an example of what Tally might hear with her hearing aids. I know you're concerned about the amount of maximum power output that she's getting. All hearing aids have some kind of a cutoff point at which the sound is not allowed to go any louder. And usually the hearing aids have some kind of um, uh, control that uh, you can change the MPO, make it higher or lower, mm -hmm. and they usually have a control to change the tone. You can have more highs and fewer lows, more lows and fewer highs. Uh, mm. la, la, la. Okay, put on your hearing aid. Can you put it on? Get that ear mold in your ear. Twist it and turn it. You will frequently hear the term residual hearing. Help me. Okay, I'm going to Residual help. hearing means that little bit of hearing at the bottom of the audiogram that can be reached if the sound is sufficiently loud. Turn it on. Up, 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 up. It is vitally important that this residual hearing be used in order to make it possible for the child to have contact with his environment through the sound around him. Take off your other hearing aid. Okay. I have to listen. Yeah. No. no. I don't want you to listen. Yeah. I need to listen. Yeah. I'm going to count to three, and I want your hearing aid. Yeah. One, two, three. Yeah. <laughs> OK. Early amplification is really vital for a hearing impaired child. Getting them into an educational program right away has found to have been really successful if the child is to become oral and aural. In other words, to use their listening skills and keep their good voice intonation, voice quality. Help me, please. Okay, I'm going to help you. Let's see. Okay, put on that ear mold and turn it on, turn it on. Tolly, I need your thumb, okay? Turn it on. Up, up, up. There we go. Listen, Tolly. Aye. Tolly. Aye. Oh, that was good! Ba, 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 ba. Uh-oh. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning to you. To you. La la la. La la la. la. Up. Listen. Up. Up. Mommy? Mommy. Mm. Mommy's at work. Mommy is. Mm. Work. Mm. Mommy's at work. Mommy is. Mm. Where's Abba? Abba home. Abba's at home. Abba home. Abba's at home. 
about home. Good for you. Are you ready to go outside? Um, okay. I want to go outside. Uh, no, outside. Okay, you can go. Can I have a hug? Can I have a hug? I need to have a hug. Did you okay. tell Doug President Reagan got hearing aids? That's what he was doing at the, the house clinic, was he was getting hearing aids just like you. Did you know that? Yeah. In a matter of about four months, we went from three different sets of tests to make sure that what they found was correct because we didn't want to believe it, then to the clinic downtown to make sure that the diagnosis was absolutely right and that we were getting the best treatment for him that was available. Who rides in this guy? Grimace. Oh, Grimace. Oh. We just thought maybe he was lackadaisical or wasn't really interested in things. We tried to pressure him and he just kind of withdrew. We didn't really play with other kids. Come here, April. <laughs> Give me your best shot, kid. Doug has a moderate sensory no hearing loss in both ears. Now, can you hear what's going on? I can't hear anything. What do you hear now? I can hear a little, I can hear a little bit of your voice. Just a little bit? I sound real far away, don't I? This is an example of what Doug might hear without his hearing aids. Put that cookie back in the box. A little bit I can. Oh, you did the roof. And I wish that we had just taken him about two years earlier to a regular hearing clinic so he could have made up the two years by having his aids and furthering his education. Just in simple things like hearing and, and learning to count and things like that. Doug, what are you going to do on the first day of school with your hearing aids and your teacher? Huh? Should have left the battery case. Yeah. Um, and I'm... And tell her when it goes dead. Yeah, she'll have batteries to put in, huh? Yeah, you gonna show all the kids that what you have? Yeah. And how they really help you? Yeah. This is an example of what Doug might hear with his hearing aids. Put that cookie back in the box. There you go. I know. It's amazing when, when he can finally hear and then he starts to communicate. It's your whole household changes. Better now that you turned it up? I thought so. Can you hear better now that you've had your hearing aids for two months? Yeah. Can I have your hearing aids back? No. You, you won't give them back to me? I think my blood pressure actually went down when he got his hearing aids. You're real happy with them, huh? Who says, whoo, whoo, Good for you. That's the owl. That's the owl. Okay. Two more times. Honk, honk. Tolly is doing very well. She is talking. Her language has just really grown in the last year. And she's really having a lot of success in our program. I think getting the hearing aids really made it clear that my child was handicapped. I didn't like them on him, and consequently, he probably didn't like them on him either. Now I've found out that he does gain from having his hearing aids, and they are of some benefit to him.